In October 1942, a poorly maintained B-17 bomber took off from Hawaii on a mission to reach General Douglas MacArthur in the Western Pacific. The airplane carried six American Army Air Corps crew members, a civilian delivering a secret message to MacArthur, and the civilian's military aid. Because of poor navigational equipment and inaccurate weather data, the B-17 overflew its intended landing spot and ditched in the Pacific. The survivors scrambled from their sinking plane and tied together three life rafts to increase their chances for survival. They fed themselves on raw meat from the occasional bird or fish they could catch and drank whatever rainwater they could collect. After two weeks at sea, one crew member died. The U.S. military came close to abandoning its search for the remaining men. However, the civilian's wife believed fervently that her husband was still alive and demanded that the military keep searching. Nearly a month after the plane had ditched, the U.S. Navy found and rescued the men more than 500 miles off course from their intended route. No one has ever revealed the secret message intended for MacArthur, but countless Americans alive at the time knew the name of the only civilian among the rescued men. He was none other than Eddie Rickenbacker, America's greatest fighter pilot of World War I, who, later in life, owned and operated the Indianapolis Speedway for 20 years and turned Eastern Airlines from a small regional carrier into one of the biggest commercial airlines in the United States. On October 8, 1890, in the city of Columbus, Ohio, Edward Rickenbacker, his last name then spelled with an H instead of a K, was born to William and Elizabeth Rickenbacker. In 1893, Elizabeth bought two neighboring lots on East Livingston Avenue in Columbus, sold one, and built a two-room house. The house had no electricity, running water, or indoor plumbing. The family moved in and later added a kitchen. At age 10, Eddie got his first job, selling the Columbus Dispatch newspaper. In 1904, his father died after sustaining severe injuries in a fight. Around 1905, 15-year-old Eddie saw his first automobile, a two-passenger Ford. In that same year, he started studying engineering via correspondence courses from the International Correspondence Schools of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He also obtained a job with the Oscar Lear Automobile Company in Columbus, working for the firm until 1907. Rickenbacker then took a job with the Columbus Buggy Company, or CBC. Later that year, he became supervisor of the company's testing department at the tender age of 17. At age 19, he took charge of selling Firestone Columbus cars for the CBC in five Midwestern states. To increase publicity for the company, he started driving a car for William Jennings Bryan, the Democrats' three-time candidate for U.S. President. In 1910, in Red Oak, Iowa, Rickenbacker entered his first car race, promoting Firestone Columbus cars. He raced for the firm until 1912, when he became a full-time professional race car driver. On Memorial Day 1911, the future aviator, along with driver Lee Frayer, participated in the first-ever Indianapolis 500-mile race. At the end of 1912, he took a job with the car-building brothers Fred and Augie Duesenberg at the Mason Company and raced for them until the end of 1914. In that same year, driving a Duesenberg automobile in a 300-mile race in Sioux City, Iowa, he won his first major car race, beating auto racing pioneer Spencer Wishart, Harry Grant of New England, Brooklyn-born Ralph Mulford, and famed auto racer and actor Barney Oldfield. During 1915, Rickenbacker raced for the Maxwell Racing Team, then left that team to race for the Prestolite Team, and then left Prestolite at the end of 1916. At that point, he ranked third among all racers in America, having earned $60,000. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I. 
In May, Rickenbacker enlisted in the U.S. Army. In June, he arrived in France and soon became a driver on the staff of General John J. Pershing. In February 1918, Rickenbacker joined the 94th Aero Pursuit Squadron, the first all-American unit to see aerial combat. On April 24th, he earned his first confirmed air combat kill. During the next month, he shot down four more enemy aircraft, becoming an ace and earning the French War Cross. In late September, he became commander of his aero squadron, nicknamed the Hat in the Ring Squadron, to symbolize America's willingness to support the Allies' cause. On October 30, 1918, Rickenbacker achieved his 26th confirmed air kill. Two weeks later, World War I ended. At the end of the war, Rickenbacker was America's ace of aces, having shot down more enemy planes than any other American pilot. In 1919, he returned to the United States as a national hero, visiting cities across the U.S., including New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Capitalizing on his heroic status, in July of 1921, he incorporated his own automobile manufacturing company. Rickenbacker Cars debuted in January of 1922. That same year, he married Adelaide Durant, whom he had met ten years earlier in California. Along with fellow World War I flying ace Reed Chambers, he co-founded Florida Airways, which flew airmail between Atlanta and Miami. Meanwhile, the Rickenbacker Car Company was manufacturing quality vehicles, but stiff competition drove the firm into bankruptcy in 1927, leaving its owner with a debt of $250,000. In that same year, undaunted by the failure of his car company, Rickenbacker raised $700,000 to buy the Indianapolis Speedway, which he owned until the mid-1940s. In June 1929, he convinced General Motors, then his employer, to buy into the Fokker Aircraft Corporation of America. Four months later, the New York stock market crashed, plunging America into the Great Depression. In 1930, Rickenbacker received from President Hoover a singular award, the Congressional Medal of Honor for his air service in World War I. For several months in 1932, the flyer left General Motors, worked for American Airways, and then returned to his former firm. In February 1934, the new president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, canceled all airmail contracts with commercial carriers and ordered the Army Air Corps to carry the mail. Rickenbacker objected to a government takeover of shipments via private carriers and predicted frequent deadly crashes which in fact occurred. The Flyers' disgust with Roosevelt's move began his lifelong alienation from the Democratic Party. In June 1934, Roosevelt signed a new airmail act which restored private carriage of America's airmail. In 1938, Rickenbacker, with the help of some associates, bought Eastern Airlines from North American Aviation, which then owned the carrier. On September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, setting off World War II. Like Charles Lindbergh, Rickenbacker first opposed America's entrance into the war. In February 1941, a passenger plane carrying the famed Flyer and 15 others went down in a storm on approach to Atlanta's main airport. At the crash site, rescuers found everyone either dead or injured. Rickenbacker gradually recovered from life-threatening injuries, including a crushed hip socket, broken pelvis, and fractured knee. In December 1941, Imperial Japan attacked American military sites at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, and in the days soon following, other Allied military sites across the Pacific. Rickenbacker immediately threw his support behind America's entrance into the war. In March and April of 1942, at the request of General H. H. Hap Arnold, the famous flyer went on a tour of domestic military bases to determine their states of morale and readiness. 
In September, he went to England to inspect American installations located there. In October, at the request of Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, Rickenbacker set off on his ill-fated mission over the Pacific. On November 13, 24 days after his crash, the U.S. Navy rescued Rickenbacker and his fellow survivors. In mid-December, he came home to another hero's welcome. In April 1943, at further request of Secretary Stimson, Rickenbacker went on another fact-finding mission, this time to North Africa, Iran, India, China, and the Soviet Union. In 1944, upon even another request of Stimson, he went on a fact-finding mission to the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. In September of 1945, World War II officially ended and Rickenbacker finally returned full-time to commercial airline work. In the post-war years, Eastern Airlines faced increasing competition from other carriers. The airline fought back by buying new Lockheed Constellations, becoming the first commercial airline to fly them. In 1953, Eastern's board of directors elevated Rickenbacker to chairman of the board, replacing him as president and CEO with Malcolm McIntyre. The stubborn flyer resisted this change by trying to continue to exert control over the airline. But Eastern's board of directors eventually forced him to retire. In 1956, Eastern merged with Colonial Airlines and gained new routes to Bermuda, Canada, Mexico, and several cities in New England. In the late 1950s, Rickenbacker began speaking more frequently on behalf of conservative political causes. In April 1961, he gave one of his most well-known political speeches, entitled, Conservatives Must Face Up to Liberalism. In 1963, Rickenbacker and wife Adelaide moved to a Texas ranch, but his independently-minded wife found life there too dull. The couple eventually left Texas and moved to Florida to live out their retirement years. In 1967, Rickenbacker published his autobiography, a ghost-written project that took some liberties with the facts of his life. In the early 1970s, the flyer's health began to fail, and on June 23, 1973, Edward Vernon Rickenbacker died in a hospital in Zurich, Switzerland. His ashes were buried in the Rickenbacker family plot in Greenlawn Cemetery, Columbus, Ohio, the city of his birth. On the day he was buried, a missing man formation of four jets flew over his grave. The demise of Eastern Airlines came 18 years later. The carrier fell victim to a variety of causes. Airline deregulation, ruthless competition from no-frills airlines, heavy equipment expenses, labor unrest, and corporate raiding. Gone are the days of lavish airline travel and, it seems, the outsized personalities that made those days possible.